Hello friends, welcome back to the SNW audio channel. In today's video, we'll discuss the fundamentals of negative feedback and its application to voltage feedback audio amplifiers. I am dedicating this video to my thesis advisor, Professor James K. Roberge, who passed away in 2014 and taught me the foundations of feedback while I was his student. Professor Roberge was an MIT professor from 1967 to 2014 and focused his teachings and research on the areas of feedback systems and electronic circuit design. Additionally, he authored the book Operational Amplifiers, Theory and Practice, an authoritative text on the subject of op-amps and negative feedback. Much of the content of this video is based on this book and MIT's course 6302 Feedback Systems. By the way, I was actually the teaching assistant for this course way back when. In today's video, we will be covering the following subjects. Introduction to feedback, where we will cover the history of feedback amplifiers, block diagrams and Black's formula, and the advantages of feedback. Then, we'll take a look at volley plots, and finally, we'll look at stability. Under stability, we'll be looking at stability conditions, positive feedback, and we'll do a brief introduction to compensation. Let's jump into our first topic, introduction to feedback. Before we jump into the details, let's start with a quick history lesson. Harold Black invented the negative feedback amplifier while trying to fix the distortion of telephone amplifiers of the day. It is said that he came up with the concept while riding the ferry to Bell Labs in 1927. While the amplifier he designed worked and was successful at reducing distortion, Black failed to address the problem of stability since he could not figure out the conditions to guarantee it. As a result, a lot of the Bell Labs higher-ups did not take him too seriously. Later on, Bell Labs colleagues Harry Nyquist and Henry Body picked up the problem of stability. Harry Nyquist saw the problem, and he developed the Nyquist Stability Criterion to assess amplifier stability. He published his work in 1932. Nyquist's approach uses Scotch's argument principle, in other words, advanced math, and while his approach is the most definitive bulletproof method to assess stability, in practice, it's very tough to use. And actually, if you ask students, they'll tell you that it's actually very hard to understand. Hendrik Body saw Nyquist polar plots and came up with the idea of decomposing them into magnitude and phase with frequency as a parameter. We call these plots body plots, as we shall see later on. Then, he came up with metrics to assess stability, phase and gain margin, and how these metrics translate to time domain response. Engineers, found Body's method much more practical than Nyquist's since it lent itself better for system design. Hence, Body's method caught on and is what we mostly use in amplifier design to this day. Feedback systems are modeled using block diagrams. The diagram shown here is the traditional form. G of S is called the forward path, H of S the feedback path, C is a controlled variable, R is the reference variable, and E of S is the error signal, which is the difference between the feedback signal and reference R. Note that these blocks are frequency dependent, where S refers to the complex frequency J to pi F. Solving the system's equations lead us to Black's formula, which is the forward path over one plus the product of the forward path and the feedback path. The product of the forward path and the feedback path is referred as the loop gain. In other words, the combined gain of all the blocks around the feedback loop. As we shall see later on, loop gain is very important to assess the stability and much of the dynamics of the feedback loop. Now let's turn our attention to audio amplifiers. There are two kinds of class B or AB audio amplifiers that employ negative feedback. Voltage feedback and current feedback. Since the SNW BFA01 is a voltage feedback amplifier, that is what we will focus on. The diagram on the left is your typical voltage feedback amplifier. The feedback network, drawn as a box here, will typically be a passive network of R's and C's and feedbacks a fraction of the output voltage back to the input. The diagram on the right is the amplifier's block diagram. The amplifier is characterized by its open loop gain, AOL, and the feedback network by its transfer function, F of S. V error is the voltage across the input terminals of the amplifier and its magnitude will be very important during the design of the input stage later on. 
Using Black's formula, we can derive the amplifier's closed loop gain ACL as shown here. Now, here is an interesting result. If the loop gain, in other words, the product of AOL and F, is much, much greater than one, the closed loop gain becomes one over the gain of the feedback network. In other words, one over F. Therefore, the amplifier's closed loop gain is set by the feedback network and is desensitized from the imprecise open loop gain. This is the first advantage of feedback amplifiers. In addition to having imprecise open loop gain, say the amplifier also introduces disturbances as shown in the block diagram. Here, the disturbance is represented by voltage signal BD. In our audio amplifiers, our major disturbance is the crossover distortion of the output stage. Combining the system equations shown here, we arrive at the overall equation for the output. The interesting part here is that when the loop gain is much greater than 1, disturbance BD is rejected and once again, the closed loop gain is 1 over the gain of the feedback network. This is the second advantage of feedback. Disturbances and nonlinearities, in other words errors, are reduced by the loop gain. This is what helped Black solve his distortion problem in telephone amplifiers. By the way, while this sounds great and the solution to all our problems with crossover distortion, one issue we will find and will run on later is that it is hard to keep the open loop gain sufficiently high at 20 kHz to reject all the crossover distortion, so we will have to work hard to keep THD low. Let's now discuss body plots, one of our most important tools in feedback system design. Body plots are used to plot the frequency response of the amplifier system, both open loop and closed loop. They include two plots, the magnitude and the phase of the frequency response. Both plots are plotted versus frequency. Magnitude can be expressed in linear units or decibels, while phase is measured in degrees. One key feature of body plots is its ability to assess the amplifier's closed loop performance from the open loop characteristics. For stability, we will look at the loop gain L of S, as we shall cover in the next section. For closed loop gain, we can use the following neat trick. Looking at Black's formula, when the loop gain is much greater than 1, the closed loop gain is 1 over F. When the loop gain is much less than 1, the closed loop gain is the open loop gain AOL. Therefore, if you plot both the open loop gain and 1 over F on the same body plot, you can obtain the closed loop gain frequency response by tracing the smaller of the open loop gain or 1 over F in the magnitude plot, as the red trace shows on the plot on the left. Now that we have seen body plots, let me now introduce the concept of poles and zeros. In my sample body plot, you saw that the open loop gain was not flat over frequency. Poles and zeros are singularities that give a transfer function, in other words, the gain of a block, its frequency dependence. For fun, I will also describe poles and zero pairs. Now let's go one by one. Let's start with poles. A pole is a complex frequency, in other words, a value of s, at which a transfer function goes to infinity. While this definition is strictly correct, it's not very intuitive, so don't worry about it too much. After a pole, the magnitude of a transfer function rolls off at minus 20 dB per decade or 6 dB per octave, and you gain minus 90 degrees of phase shift as shown in the sample body plot. As a sample circuit, think of the RC low pass filter. At low frequencies, the capacitor is an open and the gain is 1. At the pole frequency, 1 over 2 pi RC, the capacitor starts shorting out the output to ground and the gain magnitude drops. Remember, Capacitor impedance goes down with frequency at minus 20 degree per decade. Now let's look at zeros. A zero is the complex frequency at which a transfer function goes to zero. After a zero, the transfer function's magnitude rises at 20 dB per decade or 6 dB per octave, and you gain 90 degrees of positive phase shift as shown in the sample body plot. As a sample circuit, think of the RC high pass filter. In this circuit, the DC gain is zero since the capacitor is an open. At the zero frequency, which is also DC, the gain magnitude rises as the capacitor impedance decreases. While not shown, in the RC high pass filter, you will also hit a pole at 1 over 2 pi RC when the capacitor shorts out the input and output nodes. A pole zero is a singularity pair where a pole is followed by a zero. In this case, the magnitude drops at minus 20 dB per decade after the pole, 
and then flattens out after the zero. The phase will exhibit a transitory negative phase shift, which depends on the pole zero proximity, as shown in the sample body plot. The sample circuit is the low-pass RC filter with extra capacitor C1. At the introduced zero frequency, C1 shorts out resistor R, and the circuit becomes a capacitor divider with a gain of C1 over C1 plus C2. A zero pole is a singularity pair where a zero is followed by a pole. In this case, the magnitude rises at 20 dB per decade after the zero and then flattens out after the pole. The phase will exhibit a transitory positive phase shift, which depends on the zero pole proximity as shown in the sample body plot. The sample circuit is the RC high pass filter with extra resistor R1. At the introduced pole frequency, R1 limits the impedance of the series connection of R1 and C, and the circuit becomes a resistor divider with gain R2 over R1 plus R2. One word of caution, because I did not stress this in a previous slide. While the effect on magnitude from a pole and a zero roughly starts at the pole and zero frequency, phase effects start much earlier. In fact, at the pole or zero frequency, Phase has already changed by 45 degrees, as you can see on the plots shown here. To give you another data point, at 10x below the pole or zero frequency, phase has shifted by 6 degrees. Finally, note that phase is symmetric around the pole or zero frequency. Hence, at 10x above the pole or zero frequency, the phase shift will be plus minus 84 degrees respectively, or 6 degrees off 90 degrees. Now let's go into our last topic. Stability. To discuss the stability, let's start by looking at the closed loop gain equation which we derived using Black's formula. Quick question What happens when 1 plus L of s, the denominator of the closed loop gain equation, equals 0 at any frequency s equal j to pi f? Note that the question is not for any complex frequency, it is for any frequency of the form s equal j to pi f. Well, the closed loop gain becomes infinite, the amplifier output will grow unboundedly, your amplifier will explode and go to amplifier heaven, well maybe, or maybe not, but for sure it will be unstable. As a result, the condition to avoid for stability is L equal minus 1 for any frequency f. To make this condition body plot friendly, we can decompose it into magnitude and phase. As such, the condition to avoid is magnitude equals 1 when the phase is minus 180 degrees. From the previous slide, we know to achieve stability, we must avoid the L equal minus 1 point. But how do we know how stable we are? That is where gain and phase margin come into play. If the magnitude of L equals 1 or 0 dB, phase margin is how much more phase shift can L of S have before the phase of L of S equals minus 180 degrees. Conversely, if the phase of L of S equals minus 180 degrees, gain margin is how much L of S can be gained up before the magnitude of L of S equals 1 or 0 dB. In other words, both gain and phase margin tell us how far away we are from the L equals minus 1 point. Luckily, we do not have to compute the phase and gain margins to understand our level of stability. They can be read directly from the loop gain body plot. For phase margin, first find the crossover frequency, in other words, the frequency where the magnitude of L of S falls to 1. Then, phase margin is 180 minus the phase of L of S at the crossover frequency. For gain margin, first find the phase crossover frequency, in other words, the frequency where the phase of L of S equals minus 180 degrees. Then, gain margin is 1 over the gain at the phase crossover frequency, or if expressed in dB, it is minus the gain of L of S. The biggest advantage of phase margin is that it can be used to predict the time domain and closed loop frequency response of the amplifier. As the plots show, the amount of overshoot in the pulse response and peaking in the frequency response is inversely proportional to the phase margin. In other words, less phase margin implies or will cause more overshoot and peaking. In my experience, the phase margin sweet spot is between 75 and 65 degrees, where you barely get any overshoot and no peaking. More phase margin does not hurt though, but it is not optimal. 
Until now, we've been talking a lot about the point where the loop gain equals minus 1. But what happens when you go past this condition? In other words, when the magnitude of the loop gain is greater than 1 as the phase of the loop gain sinks below 180 degrees. Well, when you hit this condition, you have entered the world of positive feedback. Your amplifier will be unstable, it may blow up, let some smoke out, possibly burn your house, and the phase and gain margins for the system will be negative. Let's understand why it's positive feedback. You have the system with the generic block diagram on the left. Then, if the magnitude of LOS equals L0, when the phase of LOS equals minus 180 degrees, then at this point, LOS is pretty much equal to minus L0. Now, it is easy to see in the block diagram how the loop becomes a positive feedback one after we combine the negative sign of L0 with the negative sign of the summer. Note that things are actually okay when the magnitude of LOS is less than 1 when the phase is minus 180 degrees. At this point, there is no loop gain left for the positive feedback to do anything, so this is a safe condition. Now that we have an understanding about the stability and margins, we can discuss compensation. Compensation is the process of modifying the system to improve performance. Let's look at an example, dominant pole compensation. Dominant pole compensation is a widely used technique in op -amp design that adds a single low frequency dominant pole at frequency f dom to roll off the magnitude at minus 20 dB per decade and force crossover with a phase shift of about minus 90 degrees or something substantially less than minus 180 degrees. Note that to ensure this high phase margin, crossover needs to happen before the non-dominant poles. The dominant pole technique is effective and it works but it's not the best for audio amplifiers. The main advantage of dominant pole is that it guarantees stability at any gain, but audio amplifiers have fixed gain, so we don't get an advantage there. Also, to achieve this guaranteed stability at any gain, dominant pole reduces the loop gain at the audio band, hence it reduces the amplifier's ability to reduce distortion. We will cover more on the topic of compensation later on. We will cover the Miller implementation of compensation, plus advanced compensation techniques like two-pole, TMC, OITPC, etc. If you are interested in the topic of negative feedback in audio amplifiers, you can find further reading material in Green's paper, A Stability and Simulation of Negative Feedback Audio Amplifier Circuits. For reference, I have put the table of contents so you can see what's in the paper. The link to this paper is below and it's also in the description of the video. Our next video will be a hands-on session using LTSpice in which I'll discuss the methods used to measure loop gain and I'll do a demonstration of Michael Tian's loop gain measurement method. Also, after this video, I will be launching an LTSpice how-to video series that will run in parallel to the SNW BFA01 VD series. I strongly believe that simulation is an integral part of the design process so to get good at electronic design, you also need to get good at LTSpice or your simulation software of preference. If you like the content of this video and want to get notified when the next video is available, please show your support to this channel by subscribing and hitting the thumbs up button for this video. Thanks for watching, until next time, goodbye friends.